Alan Brown was a tenant. Institution, but it does not help the slave, John Brown. The issue of slavery in this country had been fiercely debated in the halls of government, and by 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act allowed that slavery might be forced down the throat of free Kansas settlers by vote or violence. The controversy, which was politically established by Kansas-Nebraska, self-determination, brought settlers, both slave and anti-slave settlers, into Kansas-Nebraska. And John Brown would be one who would come to Kansas to fight against the extension of slavery into the territories. He goes out to Kansas in a wagon loaded with weapons, including artillery broadswords. These were heavy, brutal, machete-like weapons. He's not going out there for business deals. He's going out there to fight. He's going to fight against, quote, Satan's legions. The pro-slavery Missourians, the Kansas Free State people had labeled them border ruffians. Border ruffians were pro-slavery men, generally out of Missouri, who came to effect violence or to essentially crash the polls to effect an election towards a pro-slavery legislature. As individuals and families moved into Kansas, they collected with similar beliefs. Those who were the pro-slavery factions would come together. Those who were abolitionists would come together, and they would form their own villages, their own communities, and they would make attempts to defend and protect themselves. Lawrence, Kansas was an example of one of those abolitionist communities. Not far away, Pottawatomie Creek wanders through eastern Kansas with the rise of a settlement called Osawatomie. It was here that Brown and his sons would set up their operation, and it was here that Brown would live as he prepared for war in 1856. The border ruffians really hated Lawrence because it was the center of the free state activity. So in May, an army of them, a drunken rabble, really, comes into Lawrence and burns the hood, shells the hotel there with a piece of artillery and uh, burns uh, free state homes. So smoke is going up. John Brown from the Pottawatomie, Osawatomie area was part of a group of volunteers marching up to the defense of Lawrence. News of the brutal raid on Lawrence reached Brown too late for him to intervene. There would follow more news from Washington. Senator Charles Sumner, the leading anti-slavery voice of the United States Senate, had been brutally beaten by a Southern congressman, Preston Brooks, who almost killed him. And the Senate itself, the hallowed sanctuary of the United States Senate, beat him to a pulp with a cane. When news of these incidents reached Brown, one of his sons would later say that he just went crazy. Brown would seek vengeance. And this would be vengeance at its bloodiest, vengeance at its most vicious. So he takes his sons and a small group of men who have been very loyal to him, and he said, we're going to go back to Pottawatomie Creek, and we're going to deliver a retaliatory blow to compensate for what happened to Lawrence. Night fell over the smoking Kansas landscape. On May 24th, Brown and seven of his followers headed out to Pottawatomie Creek. Brown and his men called themselves the Army of the North. The first cabin they came to was the cabin of James Doyle. Old man Doyle and his two sons, grown sons, had been very active in the pro-slavery party. The Doyle family was sleeping, and they knocked at the cabin. And they invaded the cabin immediately. The men then were taken out of the cabin. And I don't think that there's any way to make it pretty because it wasn't. They were basically mutilated with broadswords. Not only did Brown and his men commit barbarities in murdering these pro-slavery men, they did it in an especially barbaric fashion. The men were simply taken out and hacked to death, in some cases to pieces. And worst of all, much of it was done before the eyes of their families. The demon which those border forays had awakened is destined never again to sleep. Old Brown, Osawatomie Brown, Brown of Kansas, the dread of border ruffians, the Moses of higher law, cannot descend into the vulgar stagnation 
of common life. David H. Strother, journalist, 1859. Brown now set about raising money from the North and acquiring weapons in pursuit of his principal object. What Brown referred to as his principal object was the overthrow of the institution of slavery. And he sought to utilize the slaves themselves in this great revolt. His grand plan would start in the upper south and then continue down through the mountains to encompass the entire south. If he were to accomplish this, he would have accomplished his task before God. Brown has really got a revolution in mind. He wants to create a revolutionary state. So he drafted a constitution for this new government he intends to install in the southern mountains once he invades the south with his guerrilla army he is gathering. Whereas slavery throughout its entire existence in the United States is none other than a mad, barbarous, unprovoked, and unjustifiable war of one portion of its citizens upon another portion in utter disregard and violation of those eternal and self-evident truths set forth in our Declaration of Independence. Brown's tiny army was comprised of very diverse individuals. All of these men were committed to abolition. All of them were willing to die for the cause. All of them were willing to follow John Brown. I expect to effect a mighty conquest even though it might be like the last victory of Samson. John Brown, 1859.